Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering atelectasis, and I know when I do the lessons, you guys always want to know which book I'm teaching out of. So for this particular subject, I'm teaching out of this book that you guys can find or order from Amazon if you wish to. If you haven't done so already, guys, please don't forget like this video, subscribe to this channel, press that red notification button so you'll be notified every single time a new video is released. Uh, please support my channel by sharing my content. That is the best way that you can support my channel and so that I can be able to make more videos for you. Don't forget I have audio lessons available for you on my website nexusnursinginstitute.com and you guys can catch me on my other social media platforms such as Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram. So guys, let's get started. I'll make this a little bit bigger for you. All right, so let's start with the definition. Look at what it says atelectasis is. It refers to closure or collapse of the alveoli and often is described in relation to x-ray findings and or clinical signs and symptoms. Now, why is that important for you to know? Well, if atelectasis is collapse of the alveoli and we know that gas exchange happens in the alveoli, what do you think will happen when the patient has atelectasis? They're not gonna be able to get rid of their CO2. They're gonna accumulate that CO2 in their body, which is gonna throw them into what? An acidotic state, right? So this is very important for you guys to understand. Remember, alveoli is where gas exchange is supposed to take place. So let's keep going. Look what it says, the most commonly described atelectasis is acute atelectasis. You guys know there's a difference between acute and chronic. Acute is something that happens immediately, right? And uh, chronic is something that's insidious, that's very long-term. So acute atelectasis, which occurs most often in the post-op setting or in people who are immobilized and have shallow mo monotonous, I, you guys, you know I can't pronounce, monotonous breathing patterns. Let's stop right there. If you're used to watching my videos, you know I've told you a million times, uh, when a patient um, has had surgery, we don't care what kind of surgery, it does not matter. If they've had invasive surgery, we're always gonna be concerned about hemorrhage, them bleeding to death, right? Them developing a DVT or that DVT dislodging, going to their lungs and um, causing a pulmonary embolism or that patient developing an infection. Those are our three concerns. Now, I want you to think about it because we saw a post-op patient here. Is it one of the most important things that you know you have to teach a patient that's post-op, regardless of the type of surgery that they have, is to what? Turn, cough, and what? Deep breathe. We want them to exercise those lung muscles. We want them to expand those muscles. We want them to use incentive spirometer because they can develop an infection such as pneumonia. Guess what? That alveoli can collapse. And again, remember the alveoli is where gas exchange takes place and we don't want to deal with atelectasis. So this is very true. Let's keep going. And also it said people who are immobilized or they have very shallow monotonous uh, breathing patterns. So they're not breathing deep or those people who are really not moving around, they're not gonna be breathing deep either, right? You're not breathing deep, you're not exercising those lungs. It's very easy for the alveoli to collapse. And you know what happens along with that collapse, collapse of the alveoli. So atelectasis is something very important to understand. Let's take a look at the pathophysiology. So it says atelectasis may occur in adults as a result of reduced ventilation or any blockage that obstructs passage of air to and from the alveoli. Guys, that includes a pulmonary embolism, okay? Thus reducing alveolar ventilation. So again, it's very important to for that um, um, alveoli to stay expand, expanded so that gas exchange can take place. Let's keep going. It says patients are at high risk for atelectasis. Here's the list. Post-op patients, because of several uh, factors, I told you what those factors were. I already listed them off to you. Take a look. A monotonous, low tidal breathing pattern, because guess what? They're not breathing deeply, may cause small airway closure and alveolar collapse. This can result from effects of anesthesia or analgesic agents. Supine positioning, let me stop right there before we even go on. You guys know that whenever a patient is having difficulty breathing, what's the first thing you wanna do? Set them up, 
You want to set them up so that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, gravity, right, can help keep that diaphragm down so their fat, their abdominal girth is pushing up against their lungs so that's easier for them to breathe. So take a look, supine positioning, splinting of the chest wall because of pain. Let's say that patient had a rib fracture and it hurts, right? So they splinted that chest wall to decrease the pain, but along with that splinting, are they really able to take deep breaths the way that they're supposed to and expand their lungs the way that they're supposed to? No. So with that decreased lung expansion comes the risk for atelectasis or abdominal distension. It makes sense, guys. If that person's abdomen is distended, that's going to push against the diaphragm, which pushes against the lungs, which causes the lungs not to expand the way that they're supposed to. So guys, all of these are things that can cause atelectasis. All of these are situations that can increase that patient's risk factor for atelectasis. Give me a second, guys. Let me check this. Okay. All of those are things that can uh, uh, put the patient at risk for atelectasis. If you're a student, you're not graduated yet, you're studying for a test coming up and atelectasis is one of those things that are on your exam. You see all of these? If I was your instructor, I would make it a select all that applies on your test. So I suggest you know them. Let's keep going. Secretion retention, airway obstruction and an impaired cough may also occur or patients may be reluctant to cough because of pain. All of those are situations that can cause a collapse of the alveoli because at the end of the day, regardless of the vehicle used, right? We still have that end result. Their lungs are not expanding the way they're supposed to, or there's some type of obstruction which will cause that alveoli to expand, um, expand that alveoli to collapse. And that's a problem because again, that is where gas exchange is supposed to take place. That's how you're supposed to get the CO2 out of your body and the oxygen in your body right there at the alveoli, okay? Let's keep going. Other risk factors, which they've mentioned again, but I want you to pay attention guys, because I said this to you. Whenever you're reading, you're studying and you see the same information being described to you, except in a different way. Pay attention. That means most likely it's going to be on your test. There's a reason the author is telling you the same thing because it's important. Look at it again. Impaired cough mechanism, debilitated, bedridden. That means decreased movement. All of these are things that would put the patient at risk for atelectasis. So let's look at the clinical manifestations, the signs and symptoms. Signs and symptoms include increasing dyspnea, difficulty breathing, cough, sputum production, tachycardia. Let's stop right here. And I want you to think about it. Why would we see tachycardia and tachypnea? Why would we see the heart rate go up and the, uh, the respirations go up? The heart is responsible for pumping oxygenated blood throughout the entire body. The heart's responsible for getting the um, RBC that's in the blood, the hemoglobin that's in the RBCs, the oxygen that's being carried in the hemoglobin that's being carried in the R RBCs is being carried in the blood, where? To all of the tissues. So if the patient has um, atelectasis and that alveoli has collapsed and that patient's not getting oxygen the way that they're supposed to, the heart's going to try to compensate. It's going to increase in rate because it's trying to push out more blood, oxygenated blood, to the tissues. Your body's going to try to survive no matter what. And so that's why you're going to see the heart rate go up. And the reason you see respirations go up because the body's trying to get oxygen to the tissues. You have um, an adelectic, you have adelectasis, the alveoli has collapsed. You don't have gas exchange taking place. The body's going to need oxygen. And so your body's going to try to um, compensate by increasing the heart rate, trying to push out oxygenated blood and increase the breathing, trying to push out oxygen to the body. Patients going to have pleural pain. Okay. The um, layers of that lung, it's going to be painful for that patient when they breathe, they're going to have central cyanosis. So guys, you can have peripheral cyanosis and central cyanosis. That's central cyanosis. What you're going to see, look at this, a bluish skin hue that is a late sign of hypoxemia. And you're going to see that bluish hue in um, their trunk, their face. Okay. Patients character, characteristically have difficulty breathing in the supine position and are anxious. And I already explained to you why. 
The lower that patient's lying down, they got their abdominal girth, their belly fat, they've got gravity just pushing against their chest. They really can't expand their lungs the way that they need to. So that's why whenever it comes to breathing, you're going to have that patient sit up and make gravity be your friend. May gravity, look, your diaphragm sits like this, right? Right under your lungs. You take a deep breath in, your diaphragm pops down. And then as you breathe out, it pops back up. Okay. So you want that. <coughs> Excuse me. You want gravity to help you when that person's sitting up for that diaphragm to be pushed down when they take a deep breath so they can take in as much oxygen as they can and the lungs can expand. All right. So that's very important for you guys to understand. The chronic nature of the alveolar collapse predisposes patients to infection, uh, distal to the obstruction. Why? Nothing's moving. What happens, guys, when nothing's moving? Bacteria loves to sit there and grow. Absolutely. And so it's so important for these patients to turn, cough, and what? Breathe deep. Let's keep going. Assessment diagnostic findings. Um, increased work of breathing and hypoxemia. Decreased breath sounds. Crackles are heard over the affected area. If we do a chest x-ray, we may see it on that chest x-ray. It will re um, reveal patchy infiltrates or consolidated areas. Depending on the amount of hypoxemia the patient has, pulse ox may demonstrate a low O2 sat. Let's stop right there, guys. Preferably, we want the oxygen saturation rate to be between 98 and 100. But if it's 95, we'll take it, but it should not be anything lower than 95. 95 to 100 is therapeutic, what we want to see, but it's even better if it's 98 to 100, but we'll take 95 to 100, nothing lower than that. So, but with these type of patients, you'll see decreased O2 sats. Look at this, less than 90. I just told you we want it to be 98 to 100, but we'll take 95. Less than 90, less than 90 is what? Respiratory distress. Okay, a lower than normal partial pressure of oxygen. As students, you guys get this confused, this PaO2 with the SpO2. Let me, let me clarify this right now because I'm tired of seeing you guys make the silly mistake. SpO2, that's your oxygen saturation. You want it 95 to 100. 95 is the lowest it should be, but we prefer it to be 98 to 100, but we'll take the 95, right? That's your oxygen saturation. Your partial pressure of oxygen, that's your PaO2. The normal range for the PaO2 is 80 to 100. So read very carefully so you guys don't make a silly mistake. Partial pressure of oxygen, 80 to 100. Oxygen saturation rate, 95 to 100. Let's look at this nursing alert. Look at what it says. Tachypnea, dyspnea, and mild to moderate hypoxemia are the hallmarks of severity of atelectasis. Hallmarks, which means the classic sign symptoms that let you know how severe that collapse of the alveoli are. Prevention, frequent turning, early mobilization, get them moving around and strategies to expand the lungs such as deep breathing, incentive spirometry, and to manage secretions, a voluntary deep breathing maneuvers at least every two hours. Turn, cough, deep breathe. That incentive spirometer is going to be your best friend with that patient. Incentive spirometry or voluntary deep breathing enhances lung expansion. Secretion management techniques include directed cough, suctioning, aerosol, aerosol uh, nebulizer treatments. Let's look at how to prevent it. Chart 23.1. Let me tell you something. As students, you guys hate charts. You just want to read the text, if you even read the text, because you guys hate reading your textbooks. You want to read everything else, right? You want to do quizlets and everything under the sun. But let me tell you something. Your textbook, these are where your test questions are coming from. Specifically, these charts, tables, diagrams, illustration, figures. Think about it. The test, test writer, the author of the textbook, wrote something in text, right? And then the same thing they wrote, they took the time to put it in a chart, in a figure, in an illustration, in a table, in a diagram for you. That means it's important. Whenever you see information repeating itself, it's important for you to know. Let's go. Change them 
change of position frequently, especially from supine to upright. And I told you why. When they're sitting upright, gravity is going to be helping you push that diaphragm down so that they can get more air in their body and their lungs can expand even more. Early mobilization, get them moving. Deep breathing and coughing. Incentive spirometry. Look at this. Administer prescribed opioids and sedatives judiciously to prevent respiratory uh, depression. That's very important because yes, this patient's gonna be in pain. They may be in pain, but we have to be careful. We have to treat the pain because if they're in pain, then that's not treated. You think they're gonna wanna take deep breaths? Absolutely not. But at the same time, what do opioids do? Excuse me, opioids decrease the heart rate. Opioids decrease what? Breathing. And this patient already has trouble breathing. You think we want to make it worse? No. So we have to do it judiciously, which means use your brain. Make sure you're checking respirations before you ever give opioids. You know that. And if you see their breathing is less than 12, are you going to give the opioid? No. You're going to hold, hold that medication and make a, make a phone call to the, um, the prescribing prescriber. Let's keep going. Perform postural drainage and per, uh, chest per, percussion as needed if that patient has fluid going on. Institute suctioning as needed. And guys, if I'm going too fast, all you got to do is press pause. I posted on here for, for, for a reason. Just press pause. You'll be good to go. Okay. Management. Strategies to prevent atelectasis, which include, again, how many times have we seen this, guys? Frequent turning, early ambulation, lung volume expansion maneuvers such as deep breathing, use of incentive spirometry. Look at this, guys, coughing. These are first line measures to minimize or prevent atelectasis. First line, hallmark, golden standard. All of those mean the most important. Okay? Let's keep going. In patients who do not respond to the first line measures or who can't perform deep breathing exercises, other treatments such as the PEEP, the CPPB, bronchoscopy, all of those can be used. Let's keep going. If the cause of atelectasis is bronchial obstruction from secretions, the secretion, look, must be removed by coughing or suctioning. Because guess what? Everything else you're doing for the patient, it's not gonna matter if those secretions are there and those secretions is what's causing the problem, okay? So they must be removed by coughing or suctioning to allow air to re-enter to that portion of the lung. So you're gonna do chest PT, nebulizer treatments, bronchoscopy, endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation may be used if it's absolutely necessary. Remember guys, in medicine, we always go from least invasive to most invasive. So we're not gonna do this unless we absolutely have to. Let's keep going. With a large uh, pleural effusion that's compressing lung tissue and causing alveolar collapse, treatment may remove, um, excuse me, may include uh, thoracentesis. And guys, thoracentesis is removing fluid from the lungs and it's, Painful. Take a look. Thoracentesis or the insertion of a chest tube. The insertion of a chest tube is even more painful. So like I said, we always go from least invasive to most. So we hope we don't have to get to this point, but sometimes it has to be done. And guys, that is your atelectasis in a nutshell. So um, I know this went by quickly. So go ahead and watch this video again if you need to. But the most important points in regards to atelectasis, atelectasis, I hit it for you. Let me know in the comment section what you guys thought about this video, what you'd like to see me cover next, and whether you'd like me to do it like this in a lesson or what I do on Sundays, which are uh, question formats. Don't forget Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I Every Sunday, I release a video where I cover test questions and I teach you how to answer them accordingly. Guys, please, 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 if you enjoyed this video, support my channel, support me. The best thing you could do besides liking the video, subscribing to my channel and commenting 
is sharing my content. Share it on your social media platform with classmates, anyone you know that's thinking about going to the nursing program. Thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.